Chapter 8 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 8 The Rival Ghosts by Brander Matthews. The good ship sped on her way across the calm Atlantic. It was an outward passage, according to the little charts which the company had charily distributed, but most of the passengers were homeward bound after a summer of rest and recreation, and they were counting the days before they might hope to see Fire Island light. On the lee side of the boat, comfortably sheltered from the wind, and just by the door of the captain's room, which was theirs during the day, sat a little group of returning americans the duchess she was down on the purser's list as mrs martin but her friends and familiars called her the duchess of washington square and baby van rensselaer she was quite old enough to vote had her sex been entitled to that duty but as the younger of two sisters she was still the baby of the family the duchess and baby van rensselaer were discussing the pleasant English voice and the not unpleasant English accent of a manly young lordling who was going to America for sport. Uncle Larry and dear Jones were enticing each other into a bet on the ship's run of the moral. "'I'll give you two to one she don't make four-twenty,' said dear Jones. "'I'll take it,' answered Uncle Larry. "'We made four-twenty-seventh the fifth day last year.' It was Uncle Larry's seventeenth visit to Europe and this was therefore his thirty-fourth voyage. "'And when did you get in?' asked Baby Van Rensselaer. "'I don't care a bit about the run, so long as we get in soon. We crossed the bar Sunday night, just seven days after we left Queenstown, and we dropped anchor off quarantine at three o'clock on Monday morning. "'I hope we shan't do that this time. I can't seem to sleep any when the boat stops.' "'I can, but I didn't continued Uncle Larry, because my stateroom was the most forward in the boat, and the donkey engine that let down the anchor was right over my head. So you got up and saw the sun rise over the bay, said dear Jones, with the electric lights of the city twinkling in the distance, and the first faint flush of the dawn in the east just over Fort Lafayette, and the rosy tinge which spread softly upward, and— Did you both come back together? asked the Duchess because he has crossed thirty-four times you must not suppose he has a monopoly in sunrises retorted dear jones no this was my own sunrise and a mighty pretty one it was too i'm not matching sunrises with you remarked uncle larry calmly but i'm willing to back a merry jest called forth by my sunrise against any two merry jests called forth by yours i confess reluctantly that my sunrise evokes no merry jest at all Dear Jones was an honest man, and would scorn to invent a merry jest on the spur of the moment. "'That's where my sunrise has the call,' said Uncle Larry, complacently. "'What was the merry jest?' was Baby Van Rensselaer's inquiry, the natural result of a feminine curiosity thus artistically excited. "'Well, here it is. I was standing aft, near a patriotic American and a wandering Irishman, and the patriotic American rashly declared that you couldn't see a sunrise like that anywhere in Europe. And this gave the Irishman his chance, and he said, Sure you don't have him there till we're through with him over there. It is true, said dear Jones thoughtfully, that they do have some things over there better than we do, for instance, umbrellas. And gowns, added the Duchess, and antiquities, this was Uncle Larry's contribution. And we do have something so much better in America, protested Baby Van Rensselaer, as yet uncorrupted by any worship of the effete monarchies of despotic Europe. We make lots of things a great deal nicer than you can get them in Europe, especially ice cream. And pretty girls, added dear Jones, but he did not look at her. And spooks, remarked Uncle Larry casually. Spooks? queried the Duchess. Spooks. I maintain the word. Ghost, if you like that better. Or specters. We turn out the best quality of spook, 
you forget the lovely ghost stories about the rhine and the black forest interrupted miss van rensselaer with feminine inconsistency i remember the rhine and the black forest and all the other haunts of elves and fairies and hobgoblins but for good honest spooks there is no place like home and what differentiates our spook spiritus americanus from the ordinary ghosts of literature is that it responds to the american sense of humor take irving's stories for example the headless horseman that's a comic ghost story and rip van winkle consider what humor and what good humor there is in the telling of his meeting with the goblin crew of hendrick hudson's men a still better example of this american way of dealing with legend and mystery is the marvellous tale of the rival ghosts the rival ghosts queried the duchess and baby van rensselaer together who were they didn't i ever tell you about them answered uncle larry a gleam of approaching joy flashing from his eye since he is bound to tell us sooner or later we'd better be resigned and hear it now said dear jones if you are not more eager i won't tell it at all oh do uncle larry you know i just dote on ghost stories pleaded baby van rensselaer once upon a time began uncle larry in fact a very few years ago there lived in the thriving town of new york a young american called duncan eliphalet duncan like his name he was half yankee and half scotch and naturally he was a lawyer and had come to new york to make his way his father was a scotchman who had come over and settled in boston and married a salem girl when eliphalet duncan was about twenty he lost both of his parents his father left him enough money to give him a start and a strong feeling of pride in his scotch birth you see there was a title in the family in scotland and although eliphalet's father was the younger son of a younger son yet he always remembered and always bade his only son to remember that this ancestry was noble his mother left him her full share of yankee grit and a little old house in salem which had belonged to her family for more than two hundred years she was a hitchcock and the hitchcocks had been settled in salem since the year one it was a great great grandfather of mr eliphalet hitchcock who was foremost in the time of the salem witchcraft craze and this little old house which she left to my friend eliphalet duncan was haunted by the ghost of one of the witches of course interrupted dear jones now how could it be the ghost of a witch since the witches were all burned at the stake you never heard of anybody who was burned having a ghost did you asked uncle larry that's an argument in favor of cremation at any rate replied dear jones evading the direct question it is if you don't like ghosts i do said baby van rensselaer and so do i added uncle larry i love a ghost as dearly as an englishman loves a lord go on with your story said the duchess majestically overruling all extraneous discussion this little old house at salem was haunted resumed uncle larry and by a very distinguished ghost or at least by a ghost with very remarkable attributes what was he like asked baby van rensselaer with a premonitory shiver of anticipatory delight it had a lot of peculiarities in the first place it never appeared to the master of the house mostly it confined its visitations to unwelcome guests in the course of the last hundred years it had frightened away four successive mothers-in-law while never intruding on the head of the household i guess that ghost had been one of the boys when he was alive and in the flesh this was dear jones contribution to the telling of the tale in the second place continued uncle larry it never frightened anybody the first time it appeared only on the second visit were the ghost seers scared but then they were scared enough for twice and they rarely mustered up courage enough to risk a third interview one of the most curious characteristics of this well-meaning spook was that it had no face or at least that nobody ever saw its face perhaps he kept his countenance veiled queried the duchess who was beginning to remember that she never did like ghost stories that was what i was never able to find out i have asked several people who saw the ghost and none of them could tell me anything about its face and yet while in its presence they never noticed its features and never remarked on their absence or concealment 
it was only afterwards when they tried to recall calmly all the circumstances of meeting with the mysterious stranger that they became aware that they had not seen its face and they could not say whether the features were covered or whether they were wanting or what the trouble was they knew only that the face was never seen and no matter how often they might see it they never fathomed this mystery to this day nobody knows whether the ghost which used to haunt the little old house in salem had a face or what manner of face it had how awfully weird said baby van Rensselaer. and why did the ghost go away i haven't said it went away answered uncle larry with much dignity but you said it used to haunt the little old house at salem so i suppose it had moved didn't it the young lady asked you shall be told in due time eliphat duncan used to spend most of his summer vacations at salem and the ghost never bothered him at all for he was the master of the house much to his disgust too because he wanted to see for himself the mysterious tenant at will of his property but he never saw it never he arranged with friends to call him whenever it might appear and he slept in the next room with the door open and yet when their frightened cries waked him the ghost was gone and his only reward was to hear reproachful sighs as soon as he went back to bed you see the ghost thought it was not fair of eliphalet to seek an introduction which was plainly unwelcome dear jones interrupted the story-teller by getting up and tucking a heavy rug more snugly around baby van Rensselaer's feet for the sky was now overcast and gray and the air was damp and penetrating one fine spring morning pursued uncle larry eliphalet duncan received great news i told you that there was a title in the family in scotland and that eliphalet's father was the younger son of a younger son well it happened that all eliphalet's father's brothers and uncles had died off without male issue except the eldest son of the eldest son and he of course bore the title and was baron duncan of duncan now the great news that eliphalet duncan received in new york one fine spring morning was that baron duncan and his only son had been yachting in the hebrides and they had been caught in a black squall and they were both dead so my friend eliphalet duncan inherited the title and the estates how romantic said the duchess so he was a baron well answered uncle larry he was a baron if he chose but he didn't choose more fool he said dear jones sententiously well answered uncle larry i'm not so sure of that you see eliphalet duncan was half scotch and half yankee and he had two eyes to the main chance he held his tongue about his windfall of luck until he could find out whether the scotch estates were enough to keep up the scotch title he soon discovered that they were not and that the late lord duncan having married money kept up such state as he could out of the revenues of the dowry of lady duncan and eliphalet he decided that he would rather be a well-fed lawyer in new york living comfortably on his practice than a starving lord in scotland living scantily on his title but he kept his title asked the duchess well answered uncle larry he kept it quiet i knew it and a friend or two more but eliphalet was a sight too smart to put baron duncan of duncan attorney and counsellor at law on his shingle what has all this got to do with your ghost asked dear jones pertinently nothing with that ghost but a good deal with another ghost eliphalet was very learned in spirit lore perhaps because he owned the haunted house at salem perhaps because he was a scotsman by descent at all events he had made a special study of the wraiths and white ladies and banshees and, and boogies of all kinds whose sayings and doings and warnings are recorded in the annals of the scottish nobility in fact he was acquainted with the habits of every reputable spook in the scotch peerage and he knew that there was a duncan ghost attached to the person of the holder of the title of baron duncan of duncan so besides being the owner of a haunted house in salem he was also a haunted man in scotland asked baby van Rensselaer. just so but the scotch ghost was not unpleasant like the salem ghost although it had one peculiarity in common with its transatlantic fellow spook it never appeared to the holder of the title just as the other never was visible to the owner of the house in fact the duncan ghost was never seen at all 
it was a guardian angel only its sole duty was to be in personal attendance on baron duncan of duncan and to warn him of impending evil the traditions of the house told that the barons of duncan had again and again felt the premonition of ill fortune some of them had yielded and withdrawn from the venture they had undertaken and it had failed dismally some had been obstinate and had hardened their hearts and had gone on reckless to defeat and to death in no case had a lord duncan been exposed to peril without fair warning then how came it that the father and son were lost in the yacht off the hebrides asked dear jones because they were too enlightened to yield to superstition there is extant now a letter of lord duncan written to his wife a few minutes before he and his son set sail in which he tells her how hard he has had to struggle with an almost overmastering desire to give up the trip had he obeyed the friendly warning of the family ghost the letter would have been spared a journey across the atlantic end of chapter eight recording by rene lacroix woodstock ontario canada